performance by Dominic Coro. Dominic is giving the talk. Hello, everyone. So this talk is again about commitments, but um, in a somewhat different setting. So we will look at a number of different properties. So let me first um, tell you about the scope of which talk. So what, kind, what properties and variants of commitments uh, do we intend to investigate here? So the first question is, well, commitments have two properties. One is called hiding and the other binding. We are, uh, hiding means you can't tell what I'm committing to and binding is I can't change my mind. And both are important. If you lose one, uh, it's pointless. But in this talk, we will be focusing on the binding property, not because hiding is unimportant, but because hiding seems well understood. So there isn't so much to talk, at least if we ask ourselves what, the good, uh, what good definitions are. But everything that I show you, their binding works out fine. So don't worry about that, but we will only think about binding. Then the next question is with the commitment, do we want statistically or computationally binding commitments? So do we want the um, binding property to hold against unlimited adversaries or under computational assumptions? In the talk just before, we wanted statistically commitment, uh, statistically binding commitments, while here we will look at computationally binding commitments. Why is this interesting? Well, there can be two reasons why you would want computationally binding commitments. Either because you might need weaker, uh, I mean, if you want, if you are willing to make both directions, hiding and binding computational, then you may need weaker assumptions possibly than if you want to, or simpler protocols than if you want to make one of them statistical. Or the other thing is you might want to make the protocol computationally binding because you want to make it statistically hiding and you don't get both at the same time. And statistically hiding is probably more important than statistically binding because that gives you everlasting security. Um, because 10 years later, someone might want to break your commitment. It's pointless to break the binding property, but they may still want to extract the data. So this is why computationally binding, statistically hiding commitment are probably better than the other way around in many applications. Then you can ask interactive versus non-interactive. Well, uh, we study non-interactive ones, not because it's a necessity, but because it's uh, simpler. So for now, any commitment I will talk about will be implicitly assumed to be non-interactive. And then the crucial point here is that we will look at security against quantum attacks. So we want that our protocols are not just secure if the adversary has a classical computer, but we want to be sure uh, secure in the future when there may be quantum computers available, and we want that our protocol will not be broken by the presence of a quantum computer. However, we do consider only classical protocols here, again, because it's a bit simpler. So the protocol we talk about will be classical, but we assume that the adversary is quantum. So this is kind of the background um, on which the rest of the talk will take place. And now let's have a look, since we want to invest, um, we want computational binding, as I said, let's have a look at the definition. So how is computationally binding usually defined in a purely classical setting as a warm-up? So you have a commitment. The sender sends a, uh, a commitment C in the commit phase. And then later when he reveals, he will send some message M and some opening information U. Um, this was called the randomness in the talk before. It doesn't really make a big difference whether we talk about randomness or some arbitrary information here. And Usually, when we talk about computational binding, the binding property is formulated as follows. We require that it is hard to find for an adversary, for a polynomial time adversary, a single commitment C that he sends here, and two different messages, M and M prime, and opening informations for M and M prime respectively, so that he opens the commitment both as M and as M prime successfully. So if the adversary finds such values here, he has obviously broken the commitment because he can open it to two values. And we call it computationally binding if the adversary cannot do that. And intuitively, this means that the adversary cannot change his mind. 
if you cannot find two different values m to which you could open the commitment, it seems pretty obvious that you will be stuck with one value m from the very start. And that's why this definition is actually a good definition. And in classical cryptography, it has turned out to be a good definition. It's pretty commonly used. And this is why I call it classical style computational binding. So I can say hard to find for quantum adversaries, which gives me a definition in the quantum realm, but I will call it then classical style computational binding against quantum adversaries. Because as I will show you, this definition is not a good idea in the quantum setting. So what's bad about it in the quantum setting? Well, um, there is, we can show, it's far from trivial and I will not tell you how, but we can show that there is a collision resistant hash function H, so a hash function where we cannot computationally find two inputs with the same output, which is even secure against quantum co adversaries. So even quantum adversaries cannot find a collision for that function. Uh, the construction is relative to an oracle. Um, would be nicer if it weren't, but it's enough to show that there are problems. So there is such a collision-resistant hash function, and then we can build a very simple pr commitment protocol from it. We pick some random value u, and then to commit to a message m, we send the hash of m concatenated u. And that is easy to see that it's classical style binding because if you could find two openings, you would have a collision for the hash function. So it's classical style binding, and we were even against quantum adversaries, and we think that would be fine. However, in this particular setting for this weird hash function, it is possi possible to construct an adversary that achieves the following. The adversary first sends some commitment C, some fake value that he makes up in a a uh, complex way using um, a quantum algorithm, then we tell him a random message and say, please open as this particular message. And then the adversary says, oh yeah, I have a u, so that hash of mu is c. And this we don't want. I mean, this means he commits to something, and then later he changes in ma his mind what should be inside. Now, we can be very surprised about this, because don't we say that he can find only one m that does this, so how can you do it for a random one? It will probably be not the one. Well, actually the classical style binding definition guarantees that he cannot find two M's and valid opening information at the same time. But this adversary may have some quantum state inside, uh, so he creates a C together with a quantum state, and then for any M he can find the corresponding U, but this will ruin his quantum state, and he cannot do it twice. So he can pick any M, but you cannot pick two of them. And the existence of such an adversary, even though the scheme is classical style binding, shows us that classical style binding is pretty useless in the quantum setting. So the question is, what do we do instead? Um, we seem to need new definitions, and this is what my talk will be mainly about. So what? definition could we use for computationally binding commitments in the quantum setting? Because it's not sufficient to just replace adversary by quantum adversary in existing definitions. So we have seen the classical definition of computationally binding is not useful if we want to do post-quantum cryptography. And we also have seen by this example that collision resistance in a quantum setting seems to be not as good as, as we would have expected. So I'm not saying collision resistance is useless. So for example, if you make a signature scheme, hashing the message before signing it seems to be still a reasonable thing. But it, it seems to be a weaker property than expected. It doesn't have this property that if I have a hash, I cannot change my mind about what is the input to the hash function. So collision resistance might also need an update. So perhaps we should expect something stronger from hash functions, and since they're is supposed to be some NIST post-quantum competition upcoming. Um, perhaps we should also wonder whether collision resistance is too weak a property that we should require from um, the hash functions there. And because of that, I propose two new definitions. First, I will propose one which is called collapse binding commitments. I will mention later why they have this funny name. Um, and that's a 
strengthening of the computational binding property in the quantum setting. And very similarly, I will define collapsing hash functions, and those are a strengthening of collision-resistant hash functions that seems to be more, more to capture the, what hash functions should do in the quantum setting. Before I come to that, let me say a little word about existing definitions. Um, if I would tell you all the approaches that have been in the literature so far on uh, dealing with the question, why well, we do find them in the um, quantum setting, uh, I would not do anything else in this talk, so I just listed alphabetically ordered uh, the names of all the authors of the papers that I would have cited here. Uh, but all the definitions, I can't go in details, have at least one of the following problems. Uh, either they need some kind of trapdoor in, in their construction, somewhere in there, uh, or they even need to be universally composable commitments. Once you have them, they are fine, but uh, it comes as a price, as a price of having more complex protocols, having more complex, uh, more stronger definitions, needing a common reference string, etc. Um, many of the definitions do not support parallel composition. So committing to two values in parallel, we may not have a guarantee that those two values are, well, that it is a, the same as committing on the pair of those values. Not all the definitions have that problem, but some. Um, then it seems to be common to, well, also most of them, uh, not the UC style ones, um, that proofs that involve rewinding are very problematic. So if you want to use those definitions, for example, in the construction of a zero-knowledge protocol, then you run into trouble because once you rewind, they behave, uh, you don't get any guarantees. Rewinding in the quantum case is very difficult. And also, many of them do not imply the knowledge of the message in a certain sense. So although you can show that you cannot change your mind about what message to do, there is no, well, often for, in classically with commitments, we have this fact that in a certain sense, you know what the commitment is. Because by rewinding you, I could get out of your mind what the messages you're committed to. So they usually capture in some way that the message I'm committing to is already there in the beginning when I commit to it. And this property is also lacking with many of the def existing definitions. So all these problems I would like to solve and preferably simultaneously. So without further ado, let me tell you the uh, definition and then I will discuss why this is a good definition. So um, I define this by a certain game that a quantum adversary plays. So the definition is only makes sense with quantum adversaries, but it implies classical definitions also. So if we satisfy this, we also have that it's secure in classical crypto. So what the adversary does is the adversary outputs some commitment, given by this arrow, C, and this commitment is a classical value. So that's so far unsurprising, he just commits to a message by outputting a classical value. And additionally, he outputs an open, uh, a message and a corresponding opening information. But the crucial point is he doesn't just output one message, M and one opening U. He puts these messages on quantum registers. So these two wires could be as in a superposition of many different pairs of message and opening. So he could, for example, if he manages, uh, output an um, like a message zero with a corresponding opening and a message one with a co corresponding opening in superposition, which does not directly um, contradict the classical binding property because it doesn't mean that he could do both at the same time. So that's the, um, I mean, he, it doesn't mean that he could put them on two wires as classical values. He can only put them possibly as a superposition. So that's the game he plays. He outputs a classical commitment and in super, a superposition between different possible values that he would open it to. And he promises, and we trust him on that, that whatever is on this wire is a valid opening. We don't know what it is. It may be many openings at the same time, but it's certainly valid opening. And then we give this message back to the adversary. That's one game. And now we 
make a little variation of that game. The adversary does the same thing, but before we give the state back to the adversary, we measure what the message is. So classically, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, whether we give it to him or whether we give it to him after looking at it, doesn't make a difference. But quantumly, there's a big difference. Namely, if there's a superposition of many messages here and I measure it, this will change the message. So this game and this game are not the same unless the adversary has only one message here. If there's only one possible message, then measuring would certainly not uh, open it. And the goal of the adversary is to tell whether he's in this game and, or this game, and we call a commitment collapse binding if the adversary cannot guess whether he's in this game or in this game. <clears throat> so, why is this a, why, what does this have even to do with binding? Let's see. So the intuition is roughly that, here's the picture just for remembering, that the adversary cannot produce several openings, or openings to different messages, I mean, in superposition. Why? Well, if he would produce several openings in superposition, then he would notice that we are measuring which one he did. Yeah, if there are several openings and we measure which, then there are afterwards not several anymore. And when he gets the state back, he start, just looks whether there are several openings. And that's, that means in a sense that there can be only, for every commitment, there can be only one message M on this wire. That's the intuition. Uh, and it's kind of true, but not really. Um, because technically speaking, he can very easily produce superpositions here. He could, for example, just perform all his operate like commit to a random message, but doing all his operations quantumly in superposition and just measuring what the resulting commitment is, and then he will be in a superposition of many possible messages that give that commitment, at least if the commitment is uh, statistically hiding. But the point is, it still kind of holds because he can't tell that there are many diff many messages on it. So this thing holds, but only in a certain kind, in the sense that. Perhaps there is a superposition of many messages, but not one that the adversary would actually notice in having. So that means if we try to make formal where this definition likes, we can only say it is weaker than saying there are no possible two openings. Yeah, so the perfect binding definition says there are no two openings. Um, it is clearly weaker because if there are no two openings, then certainly he cannot tell the difference because there can be only one message here and he will notice if we, uh, not notice if we measure. And it is stronger than just requiring that it's hard to find two openings because, well, if he finds two openings, he can just put them here in superposition and later check whether these two values are still there. Um, so it's somewhere in between, which shows already the definition at least makes some sense. It is between two definitions that make at least classically sense. So that's a good sign but that's not enough to uh, endear this definition to us. But fortunately, this definition has a lot of nice properties. So, well, this I kind of already uh, implied. It is between perfect binding and classical style binding. So that's good, probably. Um, but um, what's more important is that the problem we had with classical style binding, that the adversary can change his mind after committing, is not there anymore. So this definition, we can prove, avoids the I commit to something and later I open it to, ever, to whatever I want. So fortunately, that problem is solved, which already makes it a definition, well, it seems to be a reasonable definition then. Also, it composes in parallel, that's nice. Um, it's not so easy to achieve with commitment definitions. Um, what's even nicer is it is rewinding friendly. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, I took an existing proof of zero knowledge arguments of knowledge, uh, no, of zero knowledge proofs of knowledge, replaced all those perfectly binding commitments that were in that construction by, a class, uh, by collapse binding ones, and the proof goes through almost unmodified. So. I'm not saying that rewinding proofs are simple in the quantum case, but they don't seem to get harder by using these commitments. And that's uh, very good news because you 
can then just replace one by, uh, you can just do this plug and play. Mm, I had a perfectly binding commitment, now I replace it by weaker ones, my proofs still go through, etc. So, that's good. But all of this doesn't really help us much if there are, might be no such schemes. I mean, could it be that collapsed binding commitments are just impossible? Well, they can't be impossible because we kind of even bind, uh, construct perfectly binding ones and they would be collapsed binding. But of course we would like to have collapsed binding commitments that are, for example, at the same time statistically hiding. And that's not something we could do if we just go for perfectly binding and use this arrow. And it turns out, um, yes, we can bind, collab uh, we can construct, construct collapse binding commitments from something like, from collapsing hash functions. That's good. We will see in a moment what they actually are, but that's a good start. And actually the constructions are very simple. We, I didn't need to make up new constructions. Actually the, the most simple and natural constructions that you would want to use with collision resistant hash functions, they also work then with collapsing hash functions and then give us collapse binding commitments. Uh, yes, so there are, so the one co construction was the one I had uh, uh, on, on this picture. That's not guaranteed to be statistically hiding, but slightly more complex ones, the Halevi um, Mikali commitments, uh, they go through and they are statistically hiding. Okay, so what are collapsing hash functions? Collapsing hash functions are a strengthening of collision resistance in the quantum set. And the way we define them is actually very similar to collapse binding commitments. Actually, I never said why I call them collapse binding. Uh, it's because when we do this measurement, it's kind of just committing, or in this case hashing, is already kind of collapsing the state so it doesn't get further collapsed by measuring. That is why we call it this way. So the definition of collapsing hash functions is very similar. We say the adversary outputs a hash, is supposed to output a hash value h, like this, classically, and pre-images of that hash in superposition. And intuitively we want that he cannot find two pre-images, but again we have seen that not being able to find two pre-images is not sufficient. Instead we do the same game, he can put a superposition of pre-images here, and she should not be able to tell whether we measure this pre-image in this case, we measure which one it is, or we leave it in superposition. And then we define, it's yeah, it's collapsing if the adversary cannot tell whether we measure the pre-image as he suggests or not. And we get the following facts about collapsing hash functions. Um, we can make simple commitment schemes once we have a collapsing hash function, so they are statistically hiding. Uh, we use the uh, existing simple uh, constructions, so this gives some indication that collapse, collapsing hash function is kind of a drop-in replacement for um, collision resistant hash functions when we go to the quantum setting and collision resistance is not enough. I mean, it's a weak, I mean, having one case where it works is a weak indication, but it's something. Um, now we have just shifted the question because we may still ask, do collapsing hash functions actually exist? Um, and the answer is, well, at least in the random oracle model, they do exist. So the random oracle itself is a hash function and it turns out it is collapsing. So all the thing is possible and that gives us, well, depending on how much you like the random oracle, it either says, it either solves the problem or you can see it at least as some uh, indication that real world hash functions that are pretty random might have that property. So if, if it wouldn't hold for the random oracle, we certainly wouldn't want to make as an assumption that existing fun hash functions like SHA-3 or something are um, collapsing. So that's a kind of a minimal check. I have further work now which also can explicitly construct collapsing hashes based on a lattice assumption, but that's not part of this work and uh, not fully written up yet. So because of this, because they are these kind of uh, drop-in replacement and they are a property that at least the random oracle has, my suggestion is that collapsing should actually be a property that we expect from hash function. So if we are asking like, 
shall we, let's find a new hash function that is post-quantum secure, uh, post, yeah, post-quantum secure, then we should put on the list of required properties also the collapsing property. So for example, for the up-planned NIST uh, post-quantum crypto competition, would be cool if this would be in the list of properties that a hash function should satisfy. Um, yeah, and let me conclude with um, some open problems. So one interesting question is what are the minimal assumptions for building collapse binding commitments? Can we do it with one-way functions? I have no indication pro or contra so far. Um, I mean, lattice assumptions are a pretty strong one, but perhaps we can weaken this, perhaps by making it non-interactive. So that's, from my view, the most interesting one. Also, implications between the different definitions we have. Some of the definitions that exist are implied, but for some it's not clear, so I have some results now, but um, there are still open questions. Then a good question is, are SHA-2 and SHA-3 and other existing hash functions collapsing? So let's as assuming the round, uh, the compression function for each round is com uh, collapsing. Do merkel damgard or Sponge construction give us collapsing hash functions? Uh, well, merkel damgard does. I, uh, Sponge, I don't know yet. And then more protocols where we actually use these commitments to show what they can do and where they fail. And that's it. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Does your, does your definition handle non-uniform attackers? Yes, you can use both variant works the same. So it always uses the all reductions and all proofs are kind of black boxish. So, so if, if you the use non-uniform attacker has like non-uniform quantum advice, is still uh, your uh, suggestion is still could remain secure. Because the reason I'm asking the first attack that you showed. Yep. So the guy kind of given a random thing, it can open into uh, that challenge. Yes. So if he has like two copies of the current state, even if it's quantum, he can then open into zero and one both. Well, so the thing is that it depends which commit. I mean, the definitions you can certainly state that way very easily. The question is the existing result, existence result, because if he had, I mean, even classically, if you make a commitment scheme and you have a, an auxiliary input that may depend on the commitment scheme, then you can always just give the interaction. So non-interactive commitment cannot... It would become uh, perfectly binding. Uh, sure. Yeah, but, but if you... Um, um, but if you have, for example, an auxiliary input that cannot depend on some random choices done either uh, by, by in some public parameter or something, then non-uniform is no problem. So basically non-uniformity here has the same problems and non-problems as in the classical setting. And which ones that are, we could discuss on each specific case, but Probably not right now. Mm -hmm. Take it offline. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.